the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This year, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. It is the centennial, and what has been said over and over again is we remember and we demand. Yehi Shank, Yehi But what is it that we are demanding? We're demanding the same holiness from ourselves as we saw in the lives of the martyrs. We're also demanding recognition from the Turkish government. Even though we realize they might not do this, even though we realize they have been so apprehensive in doing this for so many years, we continue to demand for justice because we believe ultimately justice will be accomplished, if not in this life, then in the life to come. This cry for justice, this demand for justice, isn't of course limited to our calls for recognition of the Armenian Genocide. It is also a call that's going out throughout the Middle East as so many Christians are losing their homes, losing their property, as they're being persecuted. The call for justice takes many forms, and we look forward to the day when justice is truly accomplished and fully accomplished. This Sunday is known as Kalistian Iraqi, the Sunday of the coming, the Sunday of the Advent. It's a time when we're remembering the second coming of our Lord, when we're looking forward the second coming of the Lord, and we say during Badalak uh, that Jesus will come and he will judge the living and the dead. Jesus will return and judge the world. We confess this each and every time we say the Nicene Creed. We have that faith. The Bible speaks of day of our Lord's return as a day of reckoning, and particularly speaks of this Sunday as a day when we are called upon to remember his return, and remember what will happen when Jesus returns. So many people, when they think of Jesus, they think his message was a message of love, it was a message, a message of compassion and mercy, and this is absolutely true, it was, but it was not only that, it was also a strong message against evil a strong message that there would be a judgment that would come upon the earth and people need to respond to this message of mercy and love and compassion before it is too late because if they do not respond then judgment will come upon them in a very powerful and destructive way. In Isaiah chapter 66 which is today's Old Testament reading we hear the following for behold the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the storm wind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire the Lord will execute judgment, and by his sword upon all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. So we're reminded today that this day, the day of the Lord, will come, and it will come very soon. How are we to react to this news? Well, on the one hand, there's something within us that should be full of joy. That is to say, finally, justice will be accomplished, Finally, there will be a day of reckoning, and if we are living as the saints that God calls us to live as, then that will fill us with joy, that the Lord's plan is going to take this next step, and finally there will be this day of reckoning. But the gospel directs us simultaneously, in particular in the decision that our church fathers made, guided by the Holy Spirit, to put certain readings together for today. We are reminded in today's readings not to simply think of ourselves as the righteous ones. We are reminded that it is dangerous to think of ourselves as being simply righteous. Yet to make the Medad saying, Yes, our Tare, Yev Ulish Nedem, Yehavo Nedem, Aina Ben Shad Bedat Ahor Gatsutumen, Amen Mege, Inke Zinkebek Gedaya, Amen Mege, Inke Zinkebek Gedaya, Yev Ese, Inch Beskenam, Avali Surp, Yank, Avriyo, Asen, Erkochi, Prev, Kriston, Yaner. We are all called to look at ourselves and to examine ourselves and to prepare ourselves for this day of judgment. Jesus teaches that those who think themselves to be righteous are so often delusional, even though they are thought to be righteous by their peers. In particular, in today's Gospel reading, Jesus is using the example of the Pharisees. These were religious people who were teachers of the law, who were studiers of the law of God, who were looked at with great respect by the Jewish society, and yet even though they were thought to be righteous by their peers, by and large, and even though they thought themselves to be righteous, they were by and large an unrighteous group of people. And Jesus makes this clear, and he gives them a number of warnings, a number of warnings of the coming 
destruction if they don't change their ways. I'll just share one of them with you right now. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus is acknowledging that they're following the particular rules. That is to say, they're following the particular rules of tithing. They're giving a certain amount of their salary to the temple. They're giving what they're supposed to give monetarily to the poor. They're following the religious traditions by showing up. But in their hearts, Jesus knew they were very far from God. Sir the Shad Hiruir Askud's men. I think in Eden's Sir Devun Mech, Tadu Trungar Urishniruntem, Yehoret San, Avali Partsarein, Avali Surbein, they thought they were holier, they thought they were better than other people, and they were blind to their own sinfulness. <coughs> Jesus warns this, warns us by warning them, and our church fathers warn us by having us read this reading as we prepare to go into Holy Week. Be forgiving, be merciful, and live according to what God has set out for you to do spiritually. This is the message he is giving us. God is holy, and hypocrisy is unacceptable to him. As we prepare for our last week before entering Holy Week, we are all being directed to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, have I fallen into a routine in my spiritual life where I am just doing what I have to do as if I am running off a checklist and in some way my heart is distant from the Lord? It is no accident that we are being directed to be mindful of Jesus' second coming. Today's Gospel, we hear the following, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All these two commandments depend all the law and on the prophets. So while Jesus is reminding us in today's Gospel to avoid hypocrisy and to seek true spirituality, to truly be close to him, he's telling us how to do it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as being yourself. So we have to ask ourselves today, how do I achieve this, or is my faith pretentious? One of the best indicators we can have as to whether or not our hearts are where our hearts need to be is whether or not our hearts are filled with joy in the Lord. I think in Menk Urach Utsun Unik Astu Zohantem, Menk Urachen Ur Aswad Zain Kansibets Ashara, Ur Michel Irs Imia Zin Bortin Devav, Ur Bessi of Ur Havada, Amur Bedi Chimerni, Avdi Haviden Adam, Ein Havad Unik Astu Zohantem, Ein Havad Gen Mesikeletzne Urach Utyam. Does that faith fill us with joy? Does what God has revealed fill us with joy? Or do we go through our days despondent? One of the best indicators we have is if we live our lives with a sense of spiritual peace, with a sense of spiritual joy. God, we are to rejoice that God knows us, that he loves us, that he has sent his son for us, to be mindful of this, to be mindful of his ongoing presence in our lives, to be mindful of the promise that we have of eternity with him, to be mindful that he is hearing our prayers we are to be so mindful of this that we are overcome with joy, that we become the light of the world in the knowledge of what God has accomplished for us. And it is this spiritual joy, this sense of thanksgiving that we are called to live with, that becomes evangelical. You might think to yourself, though, you know, that's all well and good, the idea of being filled with peace and joy and enthusiasm in the Lord, that God is so good. But right now, I'm going through a hard time. Right now, I'm suffering. And I'm not particularly joyful. I'm not particularly at peace. And we all have our own sufferings. We all have our own difficulties. In fact, throughout our lives, we're always going to have some degree of suffering, some degree of difficulty. And we can be tempted to tell ourselves, well, that idea of rejoicing in the Lord is good, but it's not for me because personally, I'm going through hardships. Maybe other people should re rejoice, but not me. And we might think the call to rejoice is insensitive. <clears throat> but still, the call is there. No matter what we're suffering from, whether it be physical or emotional or financial or relationship, 
relationship is issues, God calls us to be filled with joy. He's directing us to understand that when we remain prayerful, when we keep our love of Him as priority in our lives, we will have that as a spiritual consequence within our souls. Our hardships, the hardships that we face, are nothing when compared with the hardships that were faced by the martyrs of the past. We are directed to understand also within the teachings of our Lord that the hardships that we are enduring are in fact spiritual tools that God is using to purge us of sin and to draw us closer in our relationship with Him. Ultimately, to prepare us for the day of judgment on the day when we will meet Him. In Hebrews 12, Paul is writing about the struggle against sin and he says the following, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Your Heavenly Father addresses you as a father addresses his son, saying, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone who he accepts as a son. God will teach us, God will discipline us if indeed we are his children. And we are to endure that with an understanding that it is a gift from God, that God is alive and active in our lives, preparing us for the day of judgment. Paul continues in Hebrews 12 saying the following, Endure hardship therefore as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So if you are going through a hardship in your life, we are to understand that as Christians, as a time of spiritual discipline, which is a gift from God, and just as gold has to be purified in fire, so too God is purifying our souls by putting us through difficulties. So for us as Christians, we look at difficulties in a different light. We look at them in the lens of the gospel and through the lens of the Bible that teaches us that God is active and no suffering, no hardship is meaningless. In fact, they are all opportunities to draw closer to him and to be purified in our faith. So we rejoice in hardship, glorifying our God and looking for the lessons he has to give us during times of difficulty. So it's crucial how we respond to suffering in our lives. Suffering is, in a sense, God's school for preparation to enter heaven. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that afflictions are producing our eternal weight of glory. And in Romans 8 he said, we will be fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. So remember, God is preparing you. He is preparing us. So the preparation that is happening through the hardships you are enduring is a spiritual preparation for the day of judgment so that you might be spiritually ready. But it's not only a preparation that is for you. It's a preparation for all God's faithful. It's a preparation for the church. I think in Aswad, God is not only preparing people individually, but he's preparing us as a faith community to meet him and on the day of his second coming. So when we endure hardships as a community, we have to remember that God is also trying to guide the church towards heaven. When we face trials, we should ask ourselves, what is God's lesson for us as a faith community? What is God trying to teach us as a church? He teaches us personal lessons, teaches us lessons as a church as well. And I'd like to give a few uh, questions that we should be asking ourselves in the light of the gospel. One is, how do we welcome people who are coming anew to the church or who are returning to the church? Do we welcome them with the love that was expressed by the father in the story of the prodigal son with open arms? Or when people come into the church new or when they come into the church when they have been gone for a while, do we welcome them with judgment? And with shame, where have you been? Why haven't you been active? Where is our hearts? Does our heart 
correspond to the heart of the Heavenly Father. God wants us to be where He is spiritually. Second, are we at peace with one another? We are commanded to forgive one another. In fact, forgiving one another is one of the conditions to getting into heaven. If we do not forgive others, our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. God's forgiveness, biblically, is not unconditional. God's forgiveness to us is conditioned on us showing that same forgiveness to others. If we do not forgive others, Scripture tells us, we will not be forgiven. So are we forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven us? Are we forgiving others even when they don't understand the sins that they have committed or the depth of the sins that they have committed? Are we showing that kind of forgiveness to one another in this community? That's something God calls us to do, to have the strength, the spiritual strength, to love as he loves. And thirdly, are we working together to build his, king, his kingdom within these walls? The church is built by community work. In the Old Testament, when God first brought the people of God together in the desert, when he brought them out of Egypt, every morning they would have to collect manna. They would have to collect the food for that day. It was daily work. It was a daily sacrifice. It required daily effort. And we are told, do not become weary in doing good. We have to understand that building up the kingdom of God on earth, maintaining the kingdom of God on the earth, is an ongoing sacrifice. Are we willing to make those ongoing sacrifices, not just to the level of our comfort, but to the level that God is calling us to make them? What is vital is that we understand that when we face hardships, God is disciplining us. He is disciplining us personally. He's also disciplining us as a faith community. Our call is to look for the lessons he's trying to give us in our lives and also in the life of the Holy Church so that we might become more devoted towards him and towards one another. So let's face our challenges, both personal and ecclesiastical challenges with faith, knowing that through these challenges, God is preparing us for the day of his second coming when he will come and take us unto himself and we will eternally glorify him together with the Father and the Holy Spirit unto the ages of ages. 